الأرض بنور ربها وأشرقت الأرض بنور ربها ووضع الكتاب وجيء بالنبيين وجيء بالنبيين والشهداء وقضي بينهم بالحق وهم لا يظلمون ووفيت كل نفس ما عملت وهو أعلم بما يفعلون وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها فتحت أبوابها وقال لهم وقال لهم خزنتها ألم ياتكم رسل منكم يتنون يتنون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين قيل ادخلوا أبواب جهنم خالدين فيها فبيس مثوى المتكبرين وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة الزمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم طبتم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء فنعم أجر العاملين وتر الملائكة حافين من حول العرش يسبحون بحمد ربهم وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين. Alright. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين. حمد حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. الحمد لله الذي أحيانا بعدما أماتنا وإليه النشور All praise is due to Allah who has brought us back to life after our death and to him is our return رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا I'm pleased with Allah as my Lord, Islam is my deen and Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم as my prophet I am pleased with Allah as my Lord, Islam as my deen, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as my prophet. I am pleased with Allah as my Lord, Islam as my deen, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as my prophet. These are some of the morning adhkar or the morning remembrances that we should utter every single morning that we wake up. Um, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves to be praised, and we send Peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Thank you guys for joining me this morning. Alhamdulillah. We want to continue with the verses from Surah to Zumar. We're reading from Surah to Zumar, uh, Surah number 39 in the Quran, from verse 68 all the way up to the end of the Surah, which is verse 75. From Surah 39, 68 to 75. Surah 39, Surah to Zumar. 68 through 75. So if you have your English translation of the Quran with you, then follow along, inshallah ta'ala. So in the last lesson, we talked about the starting from verse number 68, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
So the trumpet will be blown for the second time. Um, and everyone in the heavens and the earth will perish, will die. إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ Allah, Except those whom Allah wills. ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى And then the trumpet will be blown for the third time. And everybody will be on a different plane, in a different dimension, standing around looking at each other. And the earth will shine with the light of its Lord. And the books, everyone will have their book laid in front of them, meaning your record of deeds. Your record of deeds will be laid in front of you. And the prophets will be brought forth as witnesses over their nations. And everyone will be judged in truth. That judgment will be passed on us in truth and none of us will be wronged. Meaning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when God judges us, he will judge us in truth based upon the whole entire picture. Allah will not look at one sin that you did. Allah will not look at one good deed that you did. Allah will not condemn you to hell for one particular thing that you did and Allah will not grant you paradise as a result of the greatest of good deeds that you have done you if you go if we go to paradise it will be as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy coupled with the good that we've done but overall the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if we end up in the hellfire then it is justified against us many times over because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is too much for anybody to go to hell. So if anyone manages to get into the hellfire and we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, then that was most certainly deserved. It was most certainly deserved. Don't you know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned an authentic hadith where he said, Inna Allah katab al hasanat wa siyyat wa bayyana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote down our good deeds and our bad deeds and then he explained, he clarified how those deeds were written. Did you know this? That our good deeds and our bad deeds, they're written, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went as far as to clarify how those deeds are mentioned, how those deeds are, are calculated. The Prophet sallallahu said, Man hamma bil hasana. Whoever has the intention to do a good deed, falam ya'malha, but never does it. For a good reason. He had the intention to do a good deed. But never did it. It will be written for him as a hasana kamila. He will be given one good deed. Even for having the intention to do a good deed. But you never did it. And maybe you didn't do it for a good reason. Not that you, you had the intention on giving somebody sadaqah, giving somebody charity. But then the person said something that you didn't like. So you canceled them and you decided not to give them charity. You don't get rewarded for that. You were going to loan this person $50, but then the person made you mad. And then you decided, no, I'm not going to give you $50. You don't get rewarded for that. But let's say you were going to go visit your grandmother. Your grandmother's sick. So you want to bring her some you know, chicken noodle soup. You, you went shopping for her and you, you want, want to bring the things to her and go visit her. It's a good deed. Go visit your grandmother. Go spend time with your grandmother. However, it started snowing and raining really hard and you were afraid to go outside in that type of weather. You might get caught up in the rain or in the, in the snow. You might have an accident. So you decided against it. We were going to go visit your grandmother today, but it started snowing really, really hard. So we decided not to go to you know, safeguard ourselves, to protect ourselves. You still get rewarded as if you went to visit grandma. You still get rewarded. Men hamma bil hasana falam ya'malha. Kutiba lahu hasanan, hasanatan kamila. That whoever has the intention to do a good deed, but then doesn't do it for a good reason, it is still written for him as a good deed. SubhanAllah. Go even further. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, well, if you forget, yes, maybe you, you had the intention on doing it, but then you forgot. Yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَمَنْ هَمَّ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَيَعْثُمَّ يَعْمَلْهَا فَيَعْمَلْهَا Whoever has the intention to do a good deed and then does it, 
كُتِبَ لَهُ عَشْنَ عَشْرَةُ حَسَنَاتٍ إِلَى سَبْعَةِ مِعْ ذِعْفِ Then it will be written for him as if he did 10 good deeds up to 700 times. So every good deed that we do, it starts off as 10 good deeds. Every good deed that we do, we have the intention to do the good deed and we do it. It's written between 10 to 700 times. Did you know that? Subhanallah. This is why it's so hard to go to the hellfire. And anybody who goes to the hellfire deserved it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah, uh, وهم لا يظلمون, then they will be judged in truth and they will not be wronged in the least. Whoever has the intention to do a good deed, but then doesn't do it. Maybe they forgot or maybe something came up and prevented them from doing it. They will still have the reward as if they did one good deed. Even though they never even did it. They had the intention to do it. Something came in between them doing the good deed. They still have it written for them as a good deed. And whoever does the, whoever has the intention to do a good deed. And then they follow through with it. And they do it. It will be written for them 10 good deeds. Up to 700 times. Between 10 to 700 times. Now, this was a debate that I had with my eighth graders as we were covering this hadith in the 40 hadith in my class. And so my my eighth graders, you know, got into an argument in the classroom over this hadith because the argument was what determines whether or not your reward is 10 or your reward is 100 or your reward is 300 or your reward is 750 or 700 or 650 what determines where your reward for that particular deed stops the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said between 10 to 700 times is it the intention behind the deed or is it the deed itself or is it both so my my students you know they got into a debate in the classroom and I loved it I loved the fact that they were critical thinkers so some of my students said no it's the intention some of the students said, no, it's the action. Because not all actions are on the same level. You mean to tell me that a person who does Umrah gets the same reward as a person who does Hajj? That was their argument. So deeds in Islam are not on the same level. So some of my students said it was the deeds. And some of my students said it was the intention. Some said it was both. Just leave it there. Just leave it there on the table. Some said it was both. And the fact of the matter is that it's the intention that's behind it. Because you can do a big deed, a huge deed, but the intention behind it is not sincere. And you will not reap the reward of that deed. Even for the Salat, the Prophet Wasallam said that some people will leave out of their prayer. And the only thing that they have written for them in their prayer is a third of it, a fourth of it, a fifth, a sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth, or tenth of the Salat. So it's the intention. Because a person can do a small deed and the intention behind it is purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the person will have a reward that is beyond, you know, they imagine. Beyond what they can imagine. And I actually sent them home. I didn't want to give them the answer because I wanted them to go and do some research. So I told them to go home, present their argument, come back tomorrow and then I want to hear your arguments. I want to hear your justification. And then I will give you, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be the deciding factor in that. And alhamdulillah, mashallah, tabarakallah. They, were, they went home. They did some research. They read some of the explanations of the hadith. They came up, you know, with their, their own critical analyzation of the hadith. And it was, a, it was a very, very interesting conversation, to say the least, amongst eighth graders. But it's the intention. As a matter of fact, one of my, you know, one of my students, she she came and she said, well, what about the hadith of the woman who was a prostitute? And she climbed down in a well and she put some water in her shoe and she came back up and she gave the dog a drink of water. And as a result of that, she went to paradise. I said, you got it. Boom. Something as simple as giving a dog a drink of water. And she got paradise as a result of that. She ended the argument with that. She ended the argument. Some of my students actually might be on here listening now. Some of them follow me on Instagram. MashaAllah. Um, and so it's 
But it's the deed. It's the intention that is behind it. But whoever intends to do a good deed and does it will have it re will have the reward of doing 10 good deeds up to 700 times. Up to 700 times. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man bi sayyia, who have, Whoever has the intention to do a bad deed. Whoever has the intention to do a bad deed. And then does it. Or, or, or doesn't do it. He has the intention to do a bad deed. Man hamma bi, bi, bi sayyia, thumma lam ya'milha, but he never does it. For a good reason. Then he will have it written for him as one good deed. You had the intention to do something wrong. But then you decided against it for reasons that are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You decided against it because maybe the light bulb went off. Maybe the desire wore off because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in your heart to not want to do it anymore. Or you start to think about the consequences and you didn't want to do, deal with the consequences so you decided against it. You will be rewarded as if it was a good deed. Do you know that? Whoever has the intention to do a, a bad deed, but then doesn't do it, he will have written for him as one good deed. Subhanallah. This is why anybody who ends up in hell is deserving of it. Because you can have the intention to do something wrong, and then before you do it, you decided against it. The light bulb went off. You had a change of heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the changer of the heart, decided to change your heart and you decided against it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still writes it for you as a good deed. It's still written for you as a good deed. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, من هم بسيئة ثم يعملها يعملها Whoever has the intention to do a bad deed and then does it, it will only be written for him as one bad deed. So for every bad deed that we do, it's only written for us one bad deed. And for every good deed we do, it's written as 10. You start off at 10. No good deed that is done for the pleasure of Allah is counted as one good deed. It's multiplied between 10 to 700 times. Can you imagine if, you know, our bad deeds were counted as between 10 to 700 times? Every bad deed that we do is counted as one bad deed. One. That's it. One bad deed. So this is why anyone who ends up in hell, ends up in hell because that is the place. Jaza'an wifaqa. Jaza'an wifaqa. As Allah says in the Quran, it is a des most deserving punishment. You deserved it. So we move on to... Um, Verse number um, number 71, Surah 39, Ayah 71. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمْ زُمَرَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of skips a little bit um, going from a standing waiting for judgment. Allah does not get into the details of the judgment here in this, in this passage. He skips right past the judgment part and goes to Everybody being ushered to their place, to their final abode. So he starts with the disbelievers. This is why the surah is called Zumar. Zumar means a jama'a, means a group. Meaning people will be ushered into hell or ushered into paradise in groups. Like a chain gang. Like if a people is in prison, if I, if I can draw an image for you, if I can paint a picture for you, think about people on a chain gang, prisoners being ushered, you know, into the prison from the bus. They come off the bus and then they're ushered into the prison in a group. And the disbelievers will be led as a group to the hellfire. One group. Can you imagine standing in line, not imagine, but can you imagine a group of people, all these people standing in groups being ushered into the hellfire? This blazing, scorching place 
And keep in mind, the hellfire is on different levels. The hellfire is not one place that everybody will be. There are actually seven gates to the hellfire. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah number 15, ayah 44. Turn to Surah number 15, ayah 44. Surah Tahijr, ayah 44. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, <clears throat> وَإِنَّ جَهَنَّمْ لَمَوْعِدُهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ And the hellfire is their meeting place altogether. لَهَا سَبَعْتُ أَبْوَابِ It has seven gates. لِكُلِّ بَابٍ مِنْهُمْ مِنْهُمْ جُزْءٌ مَقْسُمٌ Seven gates to the hellfire, and every gate is an appropriate punishment for the people who enter it. So everybody is not going to the same place in hell. The munafikun, the hypocrites, those who posed as Muslims, but were not really Muslims, they will be in the lowest depth of the hellfire. إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَرِ مِنَ النَّارِ as Allah mentions in another ayat in the Quran, that indeed the hypocrites will be in the lowest depth of the hellfire. Meaning people who paraded around as if they were Muslims, knowing deep down inside in their heart that they didn't believe, that they're not fully committed to Islam. They're not really Muslim. They're just hanging around the Muslims. They're just here to benefit from whatever they can benefit from, from the religion. But they're not really Muslim. They're not really Muslim. They just hang around the Muslims so that they can benefit from what Islam has to offer. Maybe a wife, maybe some, you know, uh, some, some other benefits that they can get from being Muslim or associating with Muslims. Protection, a wife. You have many guys in prison who, you know, roam around the prison. Yeah, I'm Muslim. It's like Muslim, when? Since when you were Muslim? You never see a trace of Islam on them. When, when, when were you Muslim? They pop up during Ramadan, right? This is the hypocrites. They pop up during Ramadan in prison. So when the Muslims are getting special treatment because of their fasting or their diet, their fasting, right? So they don't go to the mess hall and eat with everybody else. They have Muslims who work in the kitchen, who put food to the side, and they work out things with the prison depending on, you know, their their relationship with the prison guards and the warden and everything like that. There are some prisoners or uh, some people who are incarcerated who the the chaplains and you know the imams or whatever they have a great relationship so the muslims they get certain perks they get certain perks because muslims are well respected in those places so when ramadan comes around they don't eat in the in the in the mess hall with everybody else they eat their their meals are made or prepared for them specially and so now you'll get the guys that come around and say they're Muslim. Meanwhile, all year long, you've never seen these guys at Jumu'ah. You've never seen these guys at Ta'lim services. You've never seen these guys at any, you know, any Islamic functions. Ramadan comes around. Oh, now everybody is Muslim. Simply because you want to get some food that the other inmates are not getting. So you will pose as a Muslim. I want you to think about the psychology of this. You will pose as a Muslim just so you can get some food perks. <laughs> just for food. It ain't like they're bringing food from the outside. I mean, it's still prison food. <laughs> it's still prison food at the end of the day. But you would pose as a Muslim just so you can go and get some of the food that the Muslims are getting. You got to be kidding me, man. For, for food? But here again, in the inside, inside of prison, it's for food. On the outside, it's for a wife, it's for a woman, it's for charity, sadaqah. You come to the masjid, you know, I'm Muslim. I'm Muslim, right? Well, in prison, food is currency. Right, but it's the same food. It's not like they're bringing food like sandwiches from Subway or some outside food, some halal food from a halal restaurant into the prison. It's still the same prison food. Same food they cook in the mess hall. They're just not serving it at the time that the regular population eats. You got to be kidding me. But then you'll pop up out of nowhere. I'm Muslim. It's just like Muslim where? When? And the funny thing about it is that it'll be some of the same guys who running around a prison chasing, you know, homosexuals, 
chasing transgender dudes that are in there, right? They call them punks in the prison, right? You chasing around punks, right? And then Ramadan come around and you want to stand next to me in the rank and pray next to me so you can get the perks of, you know, some food. Meanwhile, the whole time you out here messing with homosexuals, right? And now you going to claim that you Muslim. You got to be kidding me, man. All for food. For protection. I don't I don't want to be I don't I, I don't want to be bullied by this group or by that group. So I'll say I'm Muslim. I'll hide behind Islam. I'm a blood, I'm a crip, I'm whatever. Until it get thick and my life is on the line. Now all of a sudden I'm Muslim. Now all of a sudden I'm Muslim. Since when? You were blood yesterday. You were crip yesterday. You were nieta yesterday. Now all of a sudden your life is on the line. Your life is in peril and now you're a Muslim? <laughs> Gotta be kidding me. Yeah, this is real. These are facts. I kid you not. These are facts. I kid you not. Pure hypocrites. These people are not Muslim. These are the same people who show up at the masjid. Oh, I'm, I, I'm having struggling. You know, brother Imam, I need some sadaqa. You know, I'm struggling with my rent. Or I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that. Meanwhile, your real struggle is drugs. Your real struggle is addiction. You're not struggling with your rent. You use your rent money to buy drugs. You use your rent money to buy drugs. You come into the imam's office still high. Asking for sadaqa. But you're not a Muslim. You bought a hijab that morning. You bought a thobe that morning. <laughs> I chuckle to myself sometimes when I see guys posting pictures of themselves on Instagram, right? And... You can tell they just bought the thobe that morning because the thobe still has the creases in it from when it was folded up in the package. All they did was went to the Islamic store, bought a thobe, took it out the package and put it on. <laughs> you didn't even have the decency to buy the thobe the night before, iron it out, make it look nice, make it look decent so you could actually look like a practicing Muslim. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> I chuckled to myself. I was like, you just bought the thobe. I can still see the crease lines from when it was folded inside the package. You, you, I mean, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. I kid you not. People who will come around the Muslim community to benefit from the Muslim community. But they're not Muslim. They're not Muslims. E time come around, they know that, oh, let's go to the E. There's going to be sisters there or there's going to be brothers there. Let's go see who we can see. Never fasted the month of Ramadan. You never see them at Jumu'ah, never see them at the masjid, never see them at any Islamic functions. But the Eid come around, now everybody is Muslim. It's like, Muslim? When? <laughs> Got you. But let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, all of that, I was Muslim, all of that will be exposed. <inaudible> that indeed the hypocrites will be in the lowest depth of the hellfire. And the reason why, because a, a hypocrite is worse than a disbeliever. A disbeliever is somebody who just tells you, I ain't got time to believe in God. I don't believe in God. I'm not with all of that. They, they're clearly ungreat, ungrateful. This is a disbeliever. This is the essence of a person who is a disbeliever. They know God exists. They ain't got time for God. They ain't got time for religion. They got to work. They got to chase the dollar. We're busy with, you know, seeking our wealth, seeking our sustenance, taking care of our families, doing what I need to do. I don't got time for God. That's a disbeliever. A hypocrite is somebody that knows Islam is the truth. Knows Islam is the truth. But refuses to accept it. So they'll have one foot in, one foot out. I'm Muslim when it's convenient for me. But the essence of who I am is I'm a disbeliever. 
آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ From amongst mankind are those who say they believe in Allah on the last day, but they are not Muslims. From amongst mankind are those who say they believe in Allah in the last day, and in fact, they are not Muslims. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ They seek to deceive Allah and those who believe, but they only deceive themselves. The game that you are playing is on yourself. The game that you're playing is on yourself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمْ زُمَرًا وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمْ زُمَرًا and those who disbelieve will be ushered to the hellfire, Zumara, in a group. Ushered to the hellfire in a group. Hatta ida ja'uha. Until they come to the gate of the hellfire. Until they come to the gate of the hellfire, like the arrival of prisoners at a prison. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا Until they come to the gate of the hellfire and the gates are opened. I want you to imagine for a moment. The gate of the hellfire is open. You can feel the breeze of the, of the fire brushing up against your face as, a, as the gate of the hellfire opens. You can hear the roar of the fire as Allah mentions in another ayat. You can hear the roaring of the fire. You can feel the, the heat brushing up against your face. And the gatekeeper of the hellfire, whose name is Malik. There's another verse in the Quran where Malik speaks to the people in the hellfire. And they call out to the gatekeeper of the hellfire, Malik. O oh Malik, call on your Lord to just destroy us. We don't want to feel the pain. Just kill us. Why torture us? No, the torture is so that you can feel the pain. That's the compensation for everything that God has given you that you neglected to pay your charity on. And your charity was supposed to be your submission to him, your sacrifice for him, your belief in him. You enjoy all of the perks of being a human being. You enjoy waking up every morning. You enjoy breathing Allah's air. You enjoy seeing through the lens, through the eyes that God gave you. You enjoy the tongue talking that Allah gave you. You enjoyed all of the faculties that God has given you, yet you failed to submit yourself to God. And then you, all you want is to just be destroyed so you don't have to feel the punishment, so that you don't have to feel the pain. No, you deserve that. You deserve every bit of that. You spent 60, 70, 80 years of your life enjoying all of the perks that come with being a human being that God gave you. You enjoyed the sun. You enjoyed the moon. You look right past all of those signs. <laughs> You enjoyed, you know, you scarred yourself, you hurt yourself, your body healed itself because of the system that God put in place. You enjoyed all of that. You enjoyed children, you procreated, you had children. Never once did you properly thank God by submitting to him, submitting to his will. God arranged for your provision to come to you in your life, even though you disbelieved in him. Even though you disregarded him. Even though you totally neglected to do what you were put here to do. And that was worship him and serve him. And yet God still kept giving you, giving you, giving you. Gave you children. Gave you wealth. Gave you shelter. Gave you everything. Gave you a spouse. Gave you all of everything that you needed. Because he is Rabbul Alameen. A Rabb. He is the Lord. He takes care of his creation. And the only thing he wanted from us was to acknowledge him as the only one deserving of worship and to worship him. 
That's all. And that was too much for you. Because you were busy with the things that he created for you instead of the one whom he created you for. That's the problem. You were busy with the things that he created you created for you instead of being busy with the one whom he created you for himself. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a narration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibn Adam, inni khalaqtuka wa khalaqtu kull shay'in laka. O child of Adam, I created you and I created everything for you. Fa bi haqqi alayk. And so based upon my right over you, la tashtaghil bima khalaqtu laka amman khalaqtu laka amman khalaqtuka lahu. Do not busy yourself with the things that I created for you instead of the one whom I created you for. We, God created us for him. But we were too busy. We had other things going on. I remember when I first became Muslim and it was a girl, a female that I was dealing with and I tried to give her dawah, I tried to tell her about Islam. And she looked me in my face and she said, I ain't got time to be sitting in a mosque all day worshiping. It was like, yikes. <laughs> I took a step back because I thought something was going to drop on her from the heavens. She said, I ain't got time to be sitting in no mosque worshiping God all day long. I got bills to pay. I'm like, okay. Never heard from her again. <laughs> that was all I needed to hear. Ain't nobody got time to be sitting in a mosque all day worshiping. I got bills to pay. I got stuff to do. I never forget those words. Never. I never forgot those words. I'm just like, OMG. Wow. Yeah. وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى جَهَنَّمْ زُمَرًا And the disbelievers will be ushered to the hellfire as a group. As a group. Until they come to the gate of the hellfire. And the gatekeeper of the hellfire will say to them, Didn't God send messengers to you from amongst yourselves, speaking your language, from your culture? Didn't God send to you messengers? Alam yatikum rusulun minkum yatluna alaykum ayati rabbikum. Didn't God send to you messengers, generation after generation after generation? Sent to you scholars that carried those messages throughout the years until Allah sent another prophet, until Allah sent another messenger. There were scholars who were inheritors of the prophets. They inherit their message. They carry on that message. Didn't God send to you messengers, generation after generation after generation, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ رُسُلٌ مِّنْكُمْ يَتْلُونَ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ رَبِّكُمْ وَيُنْذِرُونَكُمْ لِقَاءَ رَبَّ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا And they all warned you about this day. They all warned you about this day. This is right before they're pushed into the hellfire. They stop at the gate. Didn't messengers come to you? Didn't God send messengers to you? Throughout the years, generation after generation after generation, and every single one of those messengers warned you about this day. And they all warned you about this day. Right? They all warned you about this day. And their response will only be, of course they did. They warned us. They warned us about this day for the longest. But there was always an excuse. I have my life to live. I don't believe in God. I think heaven, I think heaven is on earth. I think we're in hell right now. Right? We always had an excuse. And all of the other theories that have not benefited us in the least. All of the other theories that have not benefited them in the least. And they will say, of course they warned us. 
قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين They said yes of course they warned us But the punishment on the disbelievers has been justified قيل ادخلوا ابواب جهنم خالدين فيها فبئس مثوى المتكبرين And it will be said to them finally enter into hellfire your final abode Khalidina fiha for eternity. I want you to think about this for a moment. Eternity. That means there is no end. Khalidina fiha. They will dwell in hellfire, being tortured day in, day out. Anaro yu'raduna aliha. Guduan wa ashiya. Allah says the hellfire will be presented to them day and night. That's in the grave. And then Yom Al-Qiyamah, then the hellfire, the same. Every day for eternity. It's not like a, a hundred years or 50 years or 60 years or 300 years. There is no time. In the next dimension. Time does not exist. Forever. Khadidina fiha. You will burn in hell. Day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Never stops. So for those who believe hell is right here on earth. Which is the belief of the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam believes that hell is right here on earth. This is hell. I promise you this is not hell. I promise you this is not hell. The challenges that many experience if they think this is hell is as a result of their disbelief in God. The challenges that many people think that makes people think that this is hell here on earth. The challenges that they experience in their life that makes them believe that this is hell is as a result of your disbelief in God. And if this is hell to you because of your disbelief in God here, your disbelief in God here, what about what hell is on the other side because of your disbelief in God? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, whoever turns away from my remembrance, whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will live a life narrowed down. He will live a life, bunka, will live a life narrowed down. The person who turns away from the remembrance of God, the person who neglects their duty to God, they will have a life narrowed down. They will have a life that is hard and difficult. That's why you believe hell is on earth. That's why you believe this is hell. But I promise you, this is not hell. I promise you. You haven't seen hell. <laughs> but the reason why they believe that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made their life so difficult, challenge on top of challenge, difficulty on top of difficulty as a result of their disbelief. So if that is your life as a result of your disbelief in God here, then what do you think is waiting for you on the other side? This is not hell. This is nowhere near hell. It's too much good that goes on here for this to be hell. <laughs> it's too much good that goes on here for this to be hell. But the little bit that you are experiencing that makes you believe that this is hell is as a result of your neglect of God and your disbelief in God and your failure to submit to God. And if that is the consequence of this life, then you can only imagine what the consequence that waits for you on the other side. Subhanallah. But people, these individuals will burn in hell for eternity. Qila dakhulu abwaab jahannam 
They will, it will be set to them into, into the hellfire to dwell therein for eternity. For eternity. There is no coming out of that. I want you guys to think about that. There is no coming out of that. Those of our family members that are disbelievers, man, we should be crying for them. Because we know that the only thing that is stopping them from dwelling in hell for eternity is the fact that they haven't died yet. When they die, there is no reconciling that situation. There is no rectifying that. It's not no matter how much we try to tell them. It's like we always seem like we're crazy. We always seem like we're extreme. And we always seem like and they always think that they have more time. They always think that they have more time. Until they don't. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in contrast to that, he goes to something a little bit more beautiful. This is where the beauty of this passage comes in. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مِلَ الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا And then those, and we're, um, we're on verse 73. So 39, I 73. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And those who kept their duty to Allah, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ And those who kept their duty to Allah, those who had taqwa, those who had fear of Allah, those who were conscious of Allah, those who were aware of God, will be ushered to the paradise, Zumara, in groups. This is why the surah is called Zumar. Because the disbelievers will be ushered to the hellfire in groups. And the believers will be ushered to paradise in groups. And paradise is not all one level. There are different levels to paradise. There are eight gates to paradise. Did you guys know that? There are eight gates to paradise. Paradise is not all one place. Not everybody is going to be on the same level in paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, Any Muslim woman, fast her five, five daily prayers. Fast her month of Ramadan. Ata'at zawjaha. And she complies with the reasonable demands or commands of her husband. It will be said to her, It will be said to her, enter through any of the eight gates of paradise you wish. Any woman who Prays her five daily prayers, fasts her month of Ramadan, and complies with the demands, the reasonable demands of her husband. It will be said to her, enter through any of the eight gates of paradise you wish. The woman's entry into paradise is very simple. Any gate. Ayy Abu Wabil Jannah Shitti. Any of the eight gates of paradise you wish. All you have to do, right, yes, I forgot that one, and keep and maintain your chastity, right? Pray your five daily prayers, fast your month of Ramadan, maintain your chastity, and comply with the demands of your husband. Ata'at zawjaha. Obeys her husband, meaning complies with his demands that are reasonable. Four things. And it will be said to you, enter in through the gates of any of the eight gates of paradise that you wish. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and notice I didn't say obey your husband. Because it's not obedience. Obedience is to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. What a woman does with her husband is comply with his demands that are reasonable. As so long as he is demanding of you something that is in the, in accordance with our religion then you should comply 
obviously when he gives you, you know, makes a demand of you or a request of you that is outside of what our religion allows, you do not have to comply. Obedience, complete obedience is to God, not to man. And so that is why I don't translate it as obedience, because I think that we've misunderstood the concept. We've skewed the concept of obedience. It's compliance. Reasonable compliance. Willful compliance. What about the sisters who don't have husbands? Then you do the first three. Pray your five daily prayers. Fast your month of Ramadan and maintain your chastity. Maintain your chastity. That's it. And enter into the paradise through any of the eight gates that you desire. The Prophet ﷺ said there's some people who will enter into paradise through the gate of Salah. Some people who will enter into paradise through the gate of Rayan. The gate of Rayan, which is the gate for those who fast. Some people will enter into the gate into, through the gate of sadaqah, of charity. Some people will enter into the gate through jihad, fighting in the cause of Allah. And Abu Bakr asked the Prophet Wasallam, is it possible that a person can enter through all of the eight gates of paradise? And the Prophet Wasallam said, yes, Abu Bakr, and I hope that you are the one to do it. Abu Bakr, look at his ambition. He's like, all right, there's a gate for here. There's a gate here, gate here, gate here. Is it possible that a Muslim could exert himself so much that he could enter into paradise through all of the gates? And the Prophet said, yes, Abu Bakr. And I hope that you are from amongst them. SubhanAllah. Look at his ambition, though. He had great aspirations, man. SubhanAllah. Alim. It's like, skip entering into paradise through one gate. Is it possible that a person can enter into paradise through all of the gates? Do I got to be restricted to one gate? Can I be good at everything? <laughs> can I be good at giving sadaqah? Can I be good at, you know, fasting? Can I be good at, at, at prayer? Can I be good at fighting and enter into paradise through all of those gates? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, yes, and I hope that you are one of them. Allahu Akbar. There's only a very, there's only a few that are good at everything that they do for God. <laughs> there are only a few of us that are good at everything that they do for God. Sincere at everything they do and they push themselves all the way to the max. Push themselves all the way to the max. How many from amongst us? Give me one second. So the point that I'm making here is that there are some people who will exert themselves. My phone is getting ready to die. There's some people who exert themselves and, you know, are willing to make that sacrifice. There are some people who exert themselves and are willing to make that sacrifice. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا And those who feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be ushered towards paradise in groups. حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is giving us a glimpse into the situation of those who made small sacrifices in this life. You know, to reap the eternal benefits of the hereafter. After they pass over the bridge, over the hellfire, as we know that there are a number of obstacles that we have to go through, you know, before we get to this point. There is the judgment. Then there is the, you know, adjudication. 
If there are problems between individuals, people, personal violations, then those things have to be reconciled. Reconciled. So, for example, if you took the wealth of somebody unjustly, if you spilled the blood of somebody unjustly, all of those things have to be rectified before you can get into paradise. You backbit someone, you talked about someone, you spread slander, gossip about someone. Before you go to paradise, all of those things have to be reconciled. You took wealth and money from someone unjustly. You ridiculed the honor of somebody. All of those things have to be reconciled before you get to paradise. And then, of course, there's the weighing of our deeds, the scales. Your good deeds will be put in one scale, bad deeds put in another scale. Then Allah will bring, you know, whatever other good deeds, you know, people owe you. If there are people out there that owe you some good deeds, then you will come to collect those. So be mindful of the violations that we do towards other people. Because those things are not taken lightly. When your scales are being weighed and there are people out there that owe you good deeds, you will come to collect. When you're wondering why your good deeds look so light, that might be as a result of, you know, good deeds that you owe to everybody else. Be mindful. And then, of course, there is the crossing over the bridge, over the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Well, in minkum illa wariduha. There is none from amongst you except that you have to pass over this bridge. This is the bridge that goes over the hellfire 50,000 years up, 50,000 years across, 50,000 years down. 150,000 years it will take us to pass over this bridge. The Prophet ﷺ said that the bridge is uh, you know, uh, thinner than a hair and it is sharper than a knife. And everyone has to pass over this bridge and there are hooks that swing back and forth across this bridge that will snatch people off and throw them into the hell that is underneath the bridge. Everyone has to cross over this bridge. So after passing over the bridge, and there's some people that are not going to make it over the bridge, Muslims, there's some that are not going to make it over the bridge. The Prophet ﷺ said the first group of people that will go across the bridge over the hellfire will go across the bridge over the hellfire like a bolt of lightning. Like a bolt of lightning. You see how fast a bolt of lightning goes? That's how fast they will go across the bridge 150,000 years. They will go just like that. Like a, And then the second group of people that will go across the bridge will go across the bridge like a blinking of an eye. The time that it takes for you to blink your eye. So the time that it takes me for, to do this, they went across the bridge 150,000 years. That fast. That's, that's not something amazing because jinn, right? The, the jinn told Suleiman in the story of Suleiman and Bilqis. Suleiman was in Palestine. Bilqis was in Yemen. The jinn told Suleiman, I will go to Yemen, grab Bilqis' thro throne, and bring it back to you all the way here in Palestine by the time it takes you to blink your eye. That happened in this life. <laughs> that happened here in the physical world. Suleiman blinked his eye like this. This jinn went from Palestine to Yemen, grabbed this huge throne, and brought the throne from Yemen all the way back to Palestine and put it right in front of him. That happened in this life. <laughs> That's here in the physical world. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give a creature the power to go from Palestine to Yemen in the time that it takes the blink of an, a blinking eye, why do you think that God cannot give a certain group of people the power to go across a bridge 150,000 years long in the time that it takes for you to blink your eye? Allah has the power to do, do as he pleases. The next group of people will go across the bridge like a fast riding horse, galloping across the bridge. Another group of people will go across the bridge running like a, a fast runner. Some people will go across the bridge walking. And some people will go across the bridge crawling on their stomachs. Have one. God forbid you go across the bridge on your stomach. 150,000 years you crawling on your stomach, you're bound to get snatched by one of the hooks and thrown into the hellfire. 
You are bound to get snatched by one of the hooks that are swinging across this bridge and grab you and toss you into the hellfire. And this person crawling on his stomach, as the human being does, always looking for some place to place the, to put the blame. This human being will turn to God and say, why did you make me go across the bridge so slow? Here again, God's fault. It's God's fault. Not your fault. You're not taking any responsibility for what you did. Lean that up thought to me. He will turn to God and say, why are you making me go across the bridge so slow? God's fault. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn to this individual and say, Ma abta'atuka, I didn't make you go across the bridge slow. Abta'uka, amaluk. Your deeds made you go across the bridge slow. You were slow obeying me in this life, so now you slow going across the bridge. Come back to dinu to dan. As you deal, so shall you be dealt with. You were slow in obeying me. Now you want me to speed you up. Now you want me to give you the power to move quickly. When the, the adhan went off and it was time for salat, you decided, I'm going to keep working. I'll pray when I get home. How many of you right now, you don't pray on your job. You pray when you get home. You pray when you get home. You get home and you miss Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and now Isha is in. Especially now since the time for the salat are so close together. You get home and you pray when you get home. If you even pray when you get home. If you even pray when you get home. You were slow obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and now you want God to, here again, the human being, always looking for some place to put the blame. There is no excuse. It literally takes you five minutes to pray, to make salat. Five minutes. There's no way in the world you can tell me that you can't step away from whatever it is you're doing at work and pray for five minutes. Most jobs will actually accommodate you if you open your mouth. If you open your mouth and say, hey, I need to pray. Is there a place in the, uh, where I can pray? Most places will accommodate you. And this goes for our children that go to school as well. You go to your principal, you go to your teacher. Hey, is there an empty room where I can pray? They will accommodate you. Because there's nothing that people respect more than someone who, you know, honors their religion and their traditions. If you can step away and go to the bathroom for five minutes, you can step away and pray for five minutes. How would they know the difference? How would they know? Who's going to know? You say, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. You go in the bathroom, make wudu, go find a corner somewhere and make your salat. Who's going to know? Don't tell me you can't step away for five minutes. You use the bathroom, don't you? So please don't tell me that your job is so strenuous. Your job is so, you know, such a hectic environment that you can't step away. If you can step away for five minutes to use the bathroom, you can step away from five minutes to go pray. But what if you aren't dressed to offer and the place isn't a place? Then create it. Create it. Put your abaya, put your, your jilbab in your pocketbook. You give me any scenario, I'm going to give you a solution to the scenario. And every time you ask and every time I respond, it becomes more and more of a proof against you. Just submit and just say, hey, I, I, I need to do better in this area. But don't come up with excuses because I promise you, I will provide you a solution to every excuse that you present. And every solution that I provide you becomes more and more of a hujjah, more and more of a proof against you. Just submit and just say, hey, I need to do better with that. You're right. That's what we have to learn how to do as Muslims. We steady try to circumvent accountability all the time. Instead of just saying, I need to do better in this area. How about we just start doing that starting today? Stop making excuses and just submit to the fact that I need to do better. That's it. Don't make excuses anymore. Don't make excuses for your hijab. Oh, it hurts my neck under here. I can't tie the hijab because it hurts my neck. Oh, I can't do it because of this. Just submit to the fact that I need to do better. 
Oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, make me a better Muslim. Oh Allah, make me a better Muslim. That's it. Just submit to the fact that you have some shortcomings and you need to do better. That's it. Stop coming up with excuses for why you can't do this and why you can't do that and why you can't do that. Just submit to the fact that I need to do better. That's it. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps me to become a better Muslim. That's it. But using these flimsy excuses to try to wiggle your way around, it only makes you look bad as a Muslim when you stand in front of Allah. Because how are you going to answer Allah when Allah asks you? These excuses are not going to fly when you stand in front of God. I mean, subhanAllah, man, we just have to do better. Commit right now to being a better Muslim. Commit right now. I am committed to being, to arriving at the best version of myself. I know how I am right now in my current state that I am not the best version of myself. I am not the best version of myself, but I am committed. I am committed to being better and doing better. Stop listening to stuff, whether in the khutbah, whether you know, sitting here listening to a lecture and then always looking for the loophole, always looking for the justification. Just sit there in your discomfort and say, you know what? That is absolutely right. I need to do better. That's it. Nobody's judging you. I'm, some, I'm just stating facts. I'm not, I'm not judging anybody. I need to do better. <laughs> I need to do better as a Muslim. There are things when I'm sitting, when I'm not giving the khutbah and I'm sitting and I'm listening and I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I need to do better with that. I need to do better with that. Never one. I am never one for circumventing accountability. No, I'm, I'm hard on myself. I'm hard. You think I'm hard on the ummah? I'm hard on myself. I'm hard on myself. I hear things all the time and I'm just like, ooh, yeah, I need to do better with that. Let me add that to my list of things that I need to get better at. You understand? Let me add that to the list of things that I need to get better at. You understand? No need to circumvent. No need to put up all of these flimsy excuses because every single excuse you put up there is a counter to that excuse that would make you look horrible. So just stop with the excuses and just own the fact that I need to do better. That's it. I ain't judge, I'm not judging no one. I am the last person to judge you, period. I understand. But I also understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the capacity to do better and be better. That I do understand. That I do understand. And we have that starts with personal accountability. Personal accountability, period. But if you spend your entire life trying to circumvent accountability and always putting forth excuses and there's always a reason why and this a reason why, you, that's a horrible way to live your life, man. That's a horrible way to live your life. You will never be able to see yourself as the best version that you have the capacity to be if you're always making excuses. That's a victim mentality. A victim mentality. As long as you keep seeing yourself as the victim, oh, woe is me, woe is me, would that I had done this, I wish I could do this, I wish I had the ability to do that. That's a victim mentality. And as long as you see yourself as the victim, you will never see yourself as being any better than what you are because you're the victim. So why do I need to do better? I'm the victim here. So if you have a victim mentality, then you're never going to be able to see yourself in the best version that you can possibly be. You'll never be able to see that. So we'll, we'll stop here, inshallah ta'ala, because uh, we have some work to do today, alhamdulillah. Um, I appreciate you guys, your time and, you know, your, your energy. Thank you guys for, for joining me this morning. So, uh, hopefully tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, inshallah, if time permits, uh, we'll have the opportunity to discuss what happens to the believers when they reach the gate of paradise. 
what happens to the believers when they arrive at the gate of paradise. What books do I recommend to study as a student of knowledge? I'm, I'm horrible with books, man, especially in the English language. Um, but I can give you some categories that you should study as a budding student of knowledge. Categories, number one, Aqidah. Ground yourself in the matters of Aqidah, in the matters of belief. Islamic theology, ground yourself in that first. Of course, then there's Quran, then there's Arabic. Then there's Sirah, the, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu familiarizing yourself with the life of the Prophet Sallallahu The Quran was revealed during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu So if you study the Prophet's life, you are essentially studying the Quran. Because those milestones in the Prophet's life will explain to you why certain sores were revealed, why certain ayats were revealed, and it all you will all be able to make the connections. You will be able to make the connections. That sore was revealed. Oh, this was the incident that caused that ayat to be revealed. This is why that sore was revealed. Reading the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu is essential all the way up until his death. Of course, there's, you know, uh, studying Aqidah, studying um, Fiqh, you know, starting with the Salat, starting with Wudu, Tahara, how to, you know, text. Dealing with Tahara so that you ground yourself in that. You understand the basics of Tahara. And that is that includes Wudu, that includes Ghusl, and that includes Tayammum. Those three categories fall under the, the category of Tahara. Grounding yourself in those things. There should be no matter related to Tahara, whether Wudu, Ghusl, or Tayammum, that you do not understand. You, you, un, you grasp all of those things. And then you move on to Salat. Everything related to the Salat, the conditions of Salat, Shurut al Salat, Arakan al Salat, Wajibat al Salat, Mustahabat al Salat, right? The conditions of Salat, the pillars of Salat, the obligations of Salat, and the things that, you know, beautify, help to perfect your Salat. These are things that you, every Muslim, whether new Muslim, student of knowledge, you should be grounded in these things. These are the fundamentals of Islamic learning. So starting with Aqidah, then of course um, the the Quran, Tafsir, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as a small text in Fiqh. These are the basic foundations of, of your Islamic learning. And then of course, once you ground yourself in those things, then you build from there. You build from there. You go into more extensive texts that, that take you deeper and deeper. Is there a particular Fiqh book? Well, when we're talking about fiqh, it, then we're looking at which madhab, you know, which madhab are you following? If you just want general fiqh, then you can grab a book like Baluk al Maram, which leans more towards the, um, you know, it's, it's a, fiqh can be studied in two ways. You can study fiqh from hadith, or you can study fiqh from the fiqh issues and look at the hadith that the scholars use to support their fiqh. I would suggest because I'm a student of hadith, I would suggest, you know, taking a small text in, in fiqh like Bulugh al-Maram and studying those, those books, studying those texts. Or you could take Arba'in al nawawiyah the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi and start from there because Imam al nawawi has aqidah, it has fiqh, has Sira, has many different things in there. So you could take a small text like the 40 hadith of Imam al Nawawi, memorize those hadith, 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 and then go through the explanation of those hadith and use that as your foundation. If you chose to. That would be sufficient. And then of course, you know, perfect your worship. You know, perfect your worship, your ibadah. That is something I think a lot of times, especially with students of knowledge, they, they tend to overlook. They tend to think it's all about learning the information without practical application. When we were in the university, there would be students who would pray on the university campus instead of going to the Prophet's Masjid and pray. I mean, think about that. For every prayer that you pray in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, that's a thousand salat. And these students, because of how lazy they were, there was a bus. There was a bus that used to go from the, the Masjid, I mean, from the university for the students who lived on the campus of the university, there was a bus that left every morning to take the students from the university to the Prophet's Masjid and then bring them back. 
And you have many students who would just pray on the university campus because there's a huge masjid on the university campus. They would pray at the university campus instead of just going to the Prophet's masjid and pray. I mean, like, I, I, you came all the way from whatever country you came from to come to live in Medina and not pray in the Prophet's masjid? I, I used to walk. There were times where I didn't even have $3 to catch a cab and I would walk from my house to the Prophet's masjid to pray. So, soaking wet by the time I get to the masjid, but I wanted to pray at the Prophet's masjid. The only time we would kind of avoid going to the Prophet's masjid was around Hajj time because the, the masjid gets crazy with a lot of people, visitors, foreigners coming from outside and it's hard to find parking and, you know, it's just a lot going on on that time. But on a normal, no, we pray at the Prophet's masjid. Man. I still remember the spots in the Prophet's masjid that were my spots that I would go in and find my little corner and go sit down and bring my books with me and I would just spend my entire day there. I know that masjid like I know the back of my head. That was my second home. You have students who travel all around the world to come to Medina and pray at the university instead of praying at the Prophet's masjid. Man, SubhanAllah The deprivation, man, the, the, the level of deprivation is deplorable, deplorable. So focus on your ibadah, focus on your worship, focus on your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, you guys have been great. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to reward you, continue to bless you all, inshallah. Don't forget to continue donating Masjid Rolda, Rolda Islamic Center of Delaware. Our cash app is the cash app sign Rolda Islamic Center. Uh, we are headed over to our facility now to go do some cleaning up. Uh, in the facility. So alhamdulillah, there, those of you who are in the area that are coming, inshallah ta'ala, I'll meet you over there in a little bit. But we're going over to the masjid now to clean out the masjid, to gut it out, put some things into the dumpster, and, you know, kind of get it ready for construction. For those of you who are sitting at home and would like to help, would like to donate, whether you want to donate a few dollars for some coffee, tea, whatever the case may be, you can use our cash app. But if you want to donate real, for real, for real, you really want to donate so that we can get the construction underway, uh, you can hit the cash app. Cash app sign Rolda, R-A-W-D-A-H, Islamic Center, Rolda Islamic Center. Or you can use pa um, PayPal or, ca uh, or Zelle, Rolda Islamic Center of Delaware at gmail.com. جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا واخر دعوانا ان الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته